Uh, ah, yes. Está grabando. Perfecto. Vale. Pues empezamos, ¿sí? André, aquí. Okay, so welcome to this session of the Thimne Coffee Talks. Uh, today we have with us uh, Fabiola Cavaliere, recently doctor, I think, uh, from SEAT Research and Development Center in Spain. And she's going to speak about uh, how to properly optimize a car design process. Uh, thank you, Fabiola, and the floor is yours. Please start whenever you can. Thank you. Sorry, I'm Ah, sorry. It's technological. <laughs> but it was familiar. Okay, so thank you, Alejandro. First of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here where everything started. So uh, today I'm going to give you a very relaxed talk, uh, no mathematical equations. Uh, it would be just a little bit to tell you uh, my experience and the PhD student first year, and now that I'm out the academic world and into the industry. So uh, I will talk you about the project that I developed here, which uh, tells a little bit how we can optimize a car design process. And ARCO is the name that now we, we gave to this tool um, that we are trying also to implement into real industrial projects. So let me start with some introduction, not really about me, but more about the project itself. So as I said again, I developed my PhD project here. Uh, it was part of a European program. Uh, protection was the name of the project under the Marie Curie uh, program. It was a three, four year um, PhD, P PhD thesis. And um, it was, as I said, involved in several academic institutions and also industrial institutions, like it was a consortium of eight academic institutions and 12 industrial partners. And uh, basically in my case, the uh, institutions involved and the people involved, my supervising team was um, made by Pedro Diez, Sergio Plotnik, Ruben Sevilla from academic institutions, UPC and Seminar in Lacan, uh, Ruben from Swansea University, and my uh, inductor supervisor, um, Xavier Larrayo. So now um, I have to say that I'm really happy because I had a lot after my PhD to really go and uh, continue this collaboration with the industrial partner, now being an employee of the of SEAT. And uh, I'm part of the, uh, I'm working in the research and development uh, department in, in SEAT. And specifically, I'm into the um, ECAF which is the, the, the department where we, where we care about car body design check and simulation. So we, we have different activities that we develop there. Basically, we try to design, no, we, try, we do design the, uh, the, the car body structure of our uh, vehicles, and we uh, care about aerodynamics, crash, structure, fitness studies. And in my case, I joined the department uh, with the role of uh, artificial intelligence structural simulation in the sense that we are trying to include in our activities now um, some new machine learning based and um, artificial intelligence based methods. So kind of enhance our simulation activities by means of new machine learning or artificial intelligence method. And uh, the third objective that I have now inside the company is to finally apply the project which comes from my PhD to real industrial application, what we call ARCO. I will tell you what it means exactly. So um, let's start with some context and motivation uh, behind the project. And let's have a look at the standard development process, how it works normally. Uh, every car that we see in the street, it's usually a result of a long project. It usually takes up to four years, three, four years, depending on the on the car, where different phases are, of course, um, developed. And there's a point in between the design concept, the concept definition, and the real start of the project development, uh, where we want to um, improve a little bit the way we do it. So how do we do it nowadays? Um, well, we have our structural designers, 
that have to deal with a very complex problem. We have a car, it's made out of a lot of components, and our structural designers have to choose the properties for each one of these components. So most probably the material properties, the metrical properties, and many others. And then this first idea go to the simulation engineers that have to make sure through simulation. So basically, usually they first develop a simulation model in a pre-process, then they run um, the, the simulation by means of usually finite element solvers to then post-process the, 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 the results and make sure that all the functional targets are prepared. Of course, this never happens at first trial, so this converts in the very old trial and error method where many times we iterate through the process and repeat the same task many times until we are happy with the solution. Now we have several issues here. So we said it already, it's highly re repetitive. We don't have, we don't make an optimal use of time and money as a consequence due to this highly repetition of the, of the, of the task. It's very much based on the experience of our engineers, because if we don't have the time to really explore our problem, well, we will, we will usually are driven by the experience of our engineers, which is uh, fine, but also let us in a limited knowledge area, I would say, right? We don't know exactly what could happen out of new, um, new, new, new tests that we can make. So the question here is how we can orientate the world design process, like how can we go straighter to the, to the perfect, the, to the optimal solution? And also another problem here is that there's a high dependence between structural designers and simulation engineers and in general between departments. Because as far as one department hasn't finished their job, the other one cannot go over. And until they cannot check whether it's fine or not, we have to wait, they have to wait for, for their results. So there's a high dependency. Another idea is that a solution to optimize this work process is to combine our industry expertise with machine learning dimensionality reduction methods. So this was the motivation behind the world project. And we think that by introducing machine learning in CAI, so in computer-aided engineering, we have several advantages. We can reduce costs, development time. We can improve the quality, like expanding our knowledge of the problem. Uh, we can identify trends in the structural behavior. We can deal with highly dimensional problems. We will see it in a while. And also we can have to make a better use of our resources, especially by empowering a little bit the designers and avoid this high dependency in between departments. We will also see in a while what I mean by that. Okay, so um, what's the idea here? Present versus future. We said it already. The present is that we have multiple processes in order to get to the results. Pre-process, simulation, post-process, first time we get one point in our design space, right? One solution. Then we do it again and we will get another point, we will know another solution in the design uh, space. And we do it again and multiple times, so we run it many times, many clicks as I wrote it down here. And what happens, we have a lot of uh, results now, but for sure, all the analyzed configurations that we had time to, to check are much less than all the possible combinations of all the parameters of our CAC components, right? So uh, our vision is some kind limited to the, the, the test that we could make. And in our opinion, in the future, if we announce um, simulation by machine learning method, we can go to one big parametric process where we need to, first of all, define a parametric finite element model now. Then we need a parametric solver to solve it in order to get also a parametric solution. So instead of having many points in our, in our design space, we have kind of surfaces or volume where in each point with only one big parametric computation, are able, we are able to check what is the, the, the response of our, the structural response of our, of our structure. And we can fully explore then all the possible configurations of our interests. Okay, so what's going on with the parametric modeling? We are saying that in the future we would like to have parametric modeling now and not only a nominal values for our components. So like here in this car structure, for example, we wouldn't have for the green component uh, the 
y value for the thickness, we will say, okay, the thickness here should vary in a predefined range of values. In this case, from one to 1.8 millimeters. And the same for the other car components, right? So what's the point here? What's the difficulty by using standard methods? So imagine now we consider only one parameter. We have one parameter and we discretize, let's say, it, its values with 10 discretized values, right? So what does it mean that we have already 10 different configurations. We will need to run the same simulation 10 times every time we change the value. Now we add another parameter and we consider all the possible combinations of all the values they can take. So if we have two parameters and each one take 10 values, we already have 100 configurations. And if we add another one, three parameters, 1,000 configurations. And if we have 10, we already go to 10 million configurations where of course, you can imagine that 10 parameters in a real industrial problem, this doesn't sound crazy, it's very normal, but actually they are even more. So this is a high dimensional problem and we can understand that we don't have the time to run in industry 10 billion configurations and million simulations. So we cannot use standard numerical methods in order to explore the whole design process. And that's why we wanna use the machine learning in particular dimensionality reduction methods, where the basic idea is that we want to go somehow from higher to lower resolution. It's like a picture when we see it very well in detail, but maybe we are not interested in understanding all the details. We just want to see what are the main patterns. So this allows us to not only identify patterns in the global, in the global behavior, we can construct a surrogate model, which then allows us to predict the response for any other combination of the parameters in the design space of interest. So the dimensionality reduction methods in, in, in the field of machine learning help us to reduce this computational complexity, right? So uh, we can preserve somehow the, the accuracy up to a level that we are interested in, but reduce a lot the computational complexity. And uh, of course, this reduced model, or so called surrogate models, uh, help us to simplify the analysis and also to simplify the design process itself. There are different methods that we can uh, consider. Usually we, especially not only in the, in the world of engineering, structural engineering, but the most traditional and classical machine learning uh, methods based on dimensionality reduction is um, usually database. This means that we collect some data, we solve our problem for many different um, configurations, and based on this data, we construct a surrogate model. But we sacrifice somehow the physical insight because we are not, we are just collecting data and depending on our choice on how well we collect the data, then we will have some results which will hide some physical insights because, okay, this comes from uh, sim real simulations, but still the model, the machine, uh, the machine learning model itself doesn't have information. On the, on the physics. And then there are some physics-based um, machine learning methods which do take into account the physical modeling. So we take into account, we uh, include in our, in our model also the governing equation of our problem, structural problem or whatever it is. And in this case, we uh, used a dimensionality reduction method which takes into account the physics of the problem, and this is the proper generalized decomposition method. Now, some PGD basics, again, just some conceptual description of the method. So let's imagine that we have our structure and we are um, monitoring some global structural behavior, some kind of quantity of interest, right? And our question again is, okay, how does the quantity of interest change with the design partners, Julia properties with it. So what the PGD does is to go from one high dimensional problem, we, we saw it before, right? When we add a lot of parameters, we, we increase the dimensionality of the problem. So PGD goes from one high dimensional problem to a set of low dimensional soup problems. In other words, take the big problems and split it somehow in some soup problem, each one independent on, on the other one. So uh, in this case, we identify with the PGD some kind of features or modes. What does it mean? That the sum, let's say, of what 
the result of what's going on here comes somehow from an approximation, which is the sum of all these modes, right? And depending on how many modes we have, it will change the accuracy of our solution. But then for each mode, we make an, another approximation because we try to find some basis functions, each function depending independently on each design variables, such that depending on the value of, of the variables, our functions take different values and will give somehow the magnitude of this mode. So basically we go to a very complex problem, high dimensional problem, we split it in lower dimensions of problems where they depend on finding through uh, optimization techniques, the best basic functions that better describe our sub problem independently, each one from the other. And at the very end, we do it for every mode. We said it already, but that by adding the more PGD modes, we increase the accuracy of the results. So it's up to us. And finally, again, everything here is based on the governing equations of the problem. So this is physics based. Now, what are what the main advantage of the PGD problem compared to other to other methods is that uh, we don't need any prior knowledge of the solution. So usually, what we do is to run high fidelity uh, simulations, right? We collect the result for many different configurations, and this is not needed by the PGD. So this is the first big advantage. Uh, also, there are some limitations. So first of all, for example, the main assumption of PGD is that the problem has to be uh, decomposable in some problems. So we, is it really possible to split it in modes and each mode described in terms of all the parameters in a separated manner? This is always, uh, this is all, often not possible. So for, for this point, we need to find, uh, let's say, yeah, a solution to, to solve these problems. Then it's an intrusive. Um, the original PGD problem is intrusive. What does it mean that? In order to uh, apply it, we usually need to modify the governing equations. And when it's up to industrial application where we use commercial software, we cannot uh, enter the commercial software implementation. So we cannot uh, modify the, 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 the governing equation. And also in this case, so we needed to find a solution. These were two points that we had to treat during, during my PhD. And also originally the method was developed for linear elastic bound and value problem. For instance, the, the, the very uh, well-known problem, stiffness times displacement equal force, right? Uh, but what if we want to apply to other kind of problems? In my case, for example, we wanted to apply to, uh, to, to solve the model analysis of a car structure, which is another formulation. So in order to overcome a little bit all these limitations, uh, we uh, during my PhD, uh, we developed some uh, alternatives, let's say. So first of all, for the first two points, we found a way to now sample our input data and obtain a parametric expression for, for them. So usually we need to find this separated um, expression of our input data in an analytical way but when this does not exist, or when we cannot access the source code of the commercial software, this might represent an alternative. And that's what we have done. So we sampled our input data that in my case were the mass matrix and the stiffness matrix, so the main properties of car structure, and try to get an algebraic parametric expression for that. And then for the third point, uh, we uh, basically used um, a in, 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 let's say there was already um, a toolbox, an encapsulated PGD toolbox, which is basically a set of algorithms which are based on the PGD uh, method that are able not only to solve um, linear, that is able not only to, to act as a linear solver, uh, as the, in the original implementation of it, but it's also able to run any other kinds of param algebraic operation in a parametric format. So uh, thanks to this encapsulated PGD toolbox, we're able to run parametric divisions, multiplications, square roots, compression, um, and several algebraic operations, which are, for example, needed in other kind of problems like the model analysis, right? So th this was really an important point to, to reach the result and apply it to industrial problems. Now, 
leaving a little bit behind uh, the formulation itself and the method, let's go to the application. So ARCO is the name that behaves finally to this, to this tool that I'm going to show you. It comes, uh, this is a little bit um, advertisement slide, let's say, where ARCO is uh, nothing else than an advanced real-time carbide optimization tool. So let's say it's a machine learning based interactive app which allows us to explore in real time how changes in certain design variables can affect the final structural behavior of, 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 the, of, of the car in this case. So our goals here were to maximize the NVH performance of the car. NVH is the noise, vibration, and harshness performance of the car. So basically, uh, mm, uh, a quantity of interest, which is related to the static and dynamic stiffness of the structure. And this gives uh, also um, some information about the comfort of the drivers inside the car during, during the driving experience. So we want to maximize this performance, but at the same time, we want to minimize the weight, which means also mi minimizing the cost, very important point in the industry, and reduce the development time. We saw it before. It's a long process. We want to make it shorter. And again, we want to empower the design engineers. So if you remember this continuous iteration between departments, uh, we would like to have a tool like this one, which doesn't need experience in simulation engineer in order to understand which um, values of the design variables lead to good or bad results of the, in terms of performance. So th this is the main idea of the tool. And how does it work? So we can split it in three main steps. There is a first step, which is the pre-process. Here we have some user control uh, aspects because the user has, has to define the design variables of interest in which ranges uh, they want it to, to vary. And then also build a parameterized uh, finite element model. This is something which is already available in many commercial software and where you can, again, just give to any component uh, um, a range of values instead of a nominal one. Once the pre-process is done, the black box comes into play. So uh, here we have our software, which was developed, this parametric software, which starts by first of all generating the input data of interest so in all the combinations of uh, the design variables that we chose we sample just the stiffness and mass metrics so we are not solving the problem as we usually do when we collect data but we have just sampled the input data once we have it this collection of uh, input data we express them in a parametric format by using a special um, algorithm which is based on pgd and that we call compression because it takes a lot, a lot of data and tries to, to get this parametric uh, expression of it once we have our parametric input we can uh, go on with the with the implementation so here we have our software which is based Again, on PGD, it, it uses the PGD-based, uh, the PGD uh, toolbox. And in our case, uh, it solves two problems. One problem to get the static stiffness of our car. So our quantity of interest, it's some kind of equivalent torsional stiffness. In this case, we want to find out uh, what is the torsional stiffness of our car. And the dynamic stiffness, where the quantity of interest is the frequency of vibration in the first torsional mode of the car. So what we do is to um, let the, 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 the algorithm perform all this dimensionality reduction uh, operations and get some surrogate models. These are the surrogate models which allow us then to um, perform optimization um, and uh, predict the values of the result for any other combination of these parameters, right? So, and then we have the post-process where also the user plays a role. Uh, as, I, as I said before, we can run optimization study. In this case, we wanted, again, to, to maximize the performance and minimize the weight and, and the costs of, um, of the car. And then we have our real-time visualization. This is the, the best part, let's say, because, again, the designers in a very preliminary phase of the project can check in real time how changing values of the design variables uh, the, the, the performance also uh, change. 
Okay, so this is the main structure of the uh, of the tool. And now, just to give you some some results of the case of study uh, of um, that I developed during the final part of my PhD thesis. So this comes uh, from the thesis itself. The the problem under um, under study was exactly this kind of easy dummy card, so a simplified card, not like real ones, I have to say, but where we were, we considered uh, four different param parameters. Uh, two were geometrical parameters, the cross-section of the two car components colored in the slide, and the thicknesses of the same component. So we had these four parameters, and we wanted to um, construct some surrogate model to describe and predict the static equivalent torsional thickness of the car and the dynamic behavior. So there's a frequency corresponding to the first torsional mode. Um, let's go on. If it goes, okay. So for the first case, for the static problem, uh, we see that uh, by applying this torsional moment of our car and by considering the four parameters, we are able with one parametric computation to get how this quantity of interest, the equivalent torsional stiffness varies with the four parameters. Of course, we can only see up to 3D as humans. So uh, I split the fourth parameter. It, it corresponds to each of the graph and the other three are in each graph, right? So we can see already that uh, we are able to, to check a little bit what is the pattern. So uh, which parameters are influencing more or less this quantity of interest. And the interesting part here is that with um, a small variation in the design variables, we were able to, to verify that we can have a 20 percentage uh, change in the in the stiffness in the in the result. So it is actually a, a big quantity. I mean, with only one competition, we are able to get this information. And also in this case, while comparing the computational time of this method with the equivalent of running the full order simulation for all these combinations, right? So um, the computational time saved is the 80%. So the, this is also a very good um, uh, result. And the same for the, let's see if it changes. I guess not, maybe working. Okay, yes. So uh, for the dynamic analysis, same, uh, same story, let's say. We run our model analysis using the parametric solver, now specific for the dynamic problem. And again, we can see that we have a range of variation of two, three uh, hertz, which is also good. I discovered now, uh, I didn't have the feeling during the PhD if it was a big or a small range, but I have to say it's a really interesting range now, although this is a dummy car, so it's not really comparable, but still. Um, and again, with one parametric combination, we can uh, take the results in the wall design space and extract somehow what are the main patterns in the behavior. Also, another interesting, um, uh, another interesting aspect of this uh, of this method is that with standard approach, so we said it. This is the equivalent of almost six thousand five hundred final element simulation, which were. Uh, substitute, let's say, with one parametric. So, for example, for um, what concerns the, the, the licenses of commercial software, if we have to run all the simulations, this means not only computational time, but also a lot of licenses for the commercial software, which is something that in the industry really cares about. And this method doesn't need um, the commercial software because it's an in-house uh, solver and this is also a very big advantage of the method. Now for uh, what concerns the optimization study, here we said it before, we want to uh, maximize the performance, so we want to maximize the torsional frequencies and this equivalent torsional stiffness, our quantities of interest, and we want to minimize the mass of the parametric components. This was very easy because once we, we get our quantity of interest in a parametric format, we can easily apply optimization study. In this case, I use a genetic algorithm in order to, um, to get the Pareto front, which is this uh, plot in the slide, which represents somehow a trade-off between the objective functions, right? And we can see that the red points represent optimal solution, which are much less that all the possible solutions which were included in this 
in this design space. So we drastically, we drastically reduced the number of configurations to consider for um, the final decision making process, right? Okay, so this is the last part because uh, the main point was to develop somehow this app for real time visualization. So once the methodology was working, uh, we developed this. Um, I developed this this app. This is very rudimental, let's say. The, the objective now is to prove it as well. But this is a small demo. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, but uh, the idea here is that we have our parameters varying in some ranges. And while we change, we can see in real time how you cannot see it very well here. It's a little bit blurry, but you can see how the parameters are changing in the car components. And also in the Pareto front, uh, you can see how the solution is moving, the design space and if it belongs or not to the optimal solution so the, the red points in the in, in the plot and the idea is that imagine like if in a very preliminary phase of our project we are able to spend hours days whatever to run this one big parametric uh, computation and get all the possible results in our design space and then give this tool which is very user friendly to structural designers that are not expert in simulation, but can understand by varying the parameters if they are in a good or bad uh, point. So in an optimal or, or, or not point uh, of the design space. So this will really um, simplify our communication between departments and also save a lot of time. So just as uh, last considerations, right, by comparing a little bit this method with the standard approach, we said it that in this example, we were able to improve the performance of 20 percentage, some numbers here. Uh, we were able to save the 80 percentage of time. Also, we didn't mention before, but uh, this computational body network, so this parametric solution that we, that we obtain, uh, occupies much less memory than the equivalent of all the solutions of all this uh, full order simulations, right? We, we have here almost 7,000, 6,500 simulations. All these results occupies the 99% more of memory space compared to the computational Vadamecum, this parametric solution. And again, we said it before, we don't need any software licenses, which is uh, an interesting point. Some, uh, well, this is more a personal consideration, uh, but uh, again, very important. Uh, saving time in a computational time, saving storage. This is an important point today where we try to improve our uh, footprint uh, to the environment. Uh, so considering that uh, data centers and computers consume almost the 70% of the global energy, I think this is also something that could help. Okay, so now what is going on? As I said, it, since July, I'm an, an employee in SEAT, and the objective now is to scale it up the method. I feel very lucky to, to work on this project now uh, in real applications. And what we are trying to do is to test it on real, on real models. And this is the, the current challenge. And from my side, uh, that's it. Here you have some, some scientific publications that came out of the PhD project. If you are interested, you can, you can check it out. And that's it. I think we have a final thank you slide and my comment. Well, thank you very much. That was a, an impressive uh, work. Thank you, and uh, really, really interesting. I don't know if any of you have any questions, both in, in, in there in Sinkevich or, or in the comments or in, virtually. Just out of curiosity, your uh, examples maybe focus on the original mode of vibration. Why is this all of the thing that interests? What are you trying to do? Is this the goal? Yeah, this is something which is related to the real application. So usually when we try to uh, optimize this MDH, so this noise and vibration performance of the car, um, it 
comes out that the torsional uh, mode and the flexion, the first torsional and the first uh, flexional modes, actually two flexional, there's a longitudinal, let's say, mode and a transversal flexional mode. These are the three ones that we monitor to in order to make sure that the car uh, respects the, the target. So uh, it's proven that when the frequency of vibration corresponding to these modes is over or below a certain value, then the MVH performance of the car uh, is satisfactory. So this is an industrial requirement, let's say, during the design process. But this is more about feeling the vibrations rather than acoustics, because the frequency were rather low to a bigger, so it's more about the actual feeling. The, the the, there are two actually aspects, like the, 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 the structural stiffness of the car, which um, is affected by the, these values, and uh, the, the, the comfort, let's say, this is, which is more a perception, the feeling, as you were saying. Uh, and both are uh, affected by the, this moment. So uh, that's what we monitor during the process. I was wondering about that because in civil engineering, you usually design for uh, low acceleration rather mm. than optimizing frequency. Usually that's more this is the also appealing. imagine this is also the um, preliminary phase uh, of the project. So the first thing that we check are these quantities. Then uh, going on with the project, we also look at accelerations and other quantities to, to, to better uh, optimize, let's say, the, the performance itself. But in the very preliminary phase, these are the very first quantities that we that we check. I think there is a question in the here. So it's this is interactive. Yes. Um, to connect machine learning methods, I uh, like to use different machine. I, I'm not sure whether I'm, uh, I understood the question. Um, if we if the question is to use other machine learning methods, otherwise maybe the the. Um, Janov can, can run it down. Uh, the idea actually, so this is the first step, uh, applying the method now to industrial project. But generally the idea in the department is to explore a little bit the, the, the work of machine learning methods, because uh, we think it's a little inexplored yet in structural applications. And we think there's a lot of work to do. So yes. Mm, we, we are gonna we are gonna study other methods, other applications. Uh, that's our plan. Let's say. I don't know if I answered the question. Uh, it's the Any other questions? Need there one? So again, thank you very much, Pablo. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation. I don't know if you have Yes, I mean, if there are no more questions, just thank you again, Fabiola. Uh, one of the best coffees of the year, uh, truly. I mean, really impressive work. Okay. Thank you. I don't you. want to get more competence, but uh, it's it's really okay. the truth. <laughs> thank you a lot, Alejandro. Okay, thank you very much. See you soon. Hopefully. See you. Bye.